Good afternoon and welcome to uh, MZ Burning Glass strategic webinar. Um, this afternoon um, we are going to be joined by some guests and we're really going to be looking at the skills for jobs agenda but specifically uh, looking at what can be learnt from the local skills improvement plan trailblazers. I'm Will Cookson, I'm the director for communities and government. I'm joined by Ben Owen, who's also uh, director at MC Burning Glass for further education. Um, we've then also got Chris Hobson, who's the director of policy and external affairs at East Midlands Chamber of Commerce. We've got Andrew Cropley, who's the CEO of West Knotts College, and Spencer Moore, who's the director of strategy at Simspa. And I'll do more to introduce these people um, as we come to it. So um, I thought it'd be useful for anyone that hasn't joined us previously to just introduce MC Burning Glass. I'll keep this brief for anyone that has. Um, our vision is to be the global authority on the labour market. And that's really about leading that transition um, towards the future of work. And it's about using skills and capabilities to understand the world of work. Our mission is to drive economic prosperity and mobility by providing insights needed to build and develop people institutions, companies and communities. We work with a wide range of organisations from uh, local government to central government, local enterprise partnerships, through to universities, further education colleges, uh, training providers, employer representative groups, employers themselves, and so on and so forth. And what brings them together is that one that need to understand skills and talent across the place. So the agenda today, uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction to the local skills improvement plans um, because I thought that would be useful for anyone that's coming to this uh, new or fresh. Um, then we're going to, I'm going to introduce Chris, who's going to take us through the innovative approach that they've taken at East Midlands Chamber on their LSIP trailblazer. Then we'll have a panel discussion on the back of that. Um, bringing in uh, Andrew from West Knotts College and also Spencer from Simspa and then we'll have summary closing remarks and then there's a little bit of information to share at the end of the webinar and then we will let you hopefully progress towards your weekend. So um, local skills improvement plans very quickly um, we're at the phase of national rollout DfE has set aside 20.9 million to create LSIPs across 38 areas over the next three years. Interesting, those 38 areas are essentially local enterprise partnership areas or mayoral combined authority um, areas. So um, the, this all comes on the back of the FE white paper, which is now um, the Skills for Jobs Act. Um, the, plan is to basically make colleges or help colleges and training providers align their court the courses they offer to local employers needs now just to be clear this isn't saying that this hasn't already uh, progress hasn't been made against this but it's about ensuring that progress continues to be made uh, the pilots that took place um, were with eight employer representative bodies they were run um, in 2021 um, through till I think it was just before Easter and the first batch of um, local skills improvement plans have been were published last month. Um, we can share links to those if that would be useful, but they are out there. Just a quick Google away. Um, the DFE has said they expect to be able to designate uh, employer representative bodies for specific areas of the country from early autumn 2022 onwards and they're looking to get full coverage obviously this initiative is in regards to England not any of the uh, other devolved or the devolved nations um, those who become an employer representative bodies um, include they have to be corporate bodies um, they are that are both independent of government and not a public authority and I think that's really key to understanding them. And that's why we have seen um, chambers really come to the forefront in regards to this, these trailblazers and potentially in regards to the next phase. Uh, the new local skills improvement 
fund has also been announced that will be introduced in 2023 2024 each designated employer representative body will be able to apply for up to 550,000 to support the development implementation and reviews um, for the period up to March 2025. Now, this second phase, this rollout, is happening at the moment. So um, we've got we've got current expressions of interest. I think they're due in next week, um, if not the week after. Um, basically, um, that that's all in train and and progressing. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that as we come into uh, the the uh, panel discussion. Um, or in regards to the conversations that we're having from with Chris from East Midlands Chamber. I should say, if you have questions as we're going, you can use the um, control panel on the right hand side and you will see that there's um, a tab there for questions and you can raise your questions there. And if we've got time, we'll cover those off when we get to the panel discussion. I thought now would be a good time to um, introduce uh, Chris um, from East Midlands Chamber. Um, we started working with East Midlands Chamber late 2021. Um, it's a really interesting and innovative use of our data and they're drawing on that using um, our APIs. Now APIs stand for Application Programming Interface. We won't get into the technicalities around an API. I think the easiest way to understand it, it means they can draw directly on our data and then present that in the way that uh, the organisation sees fit or most applicable to their use case. And I think this is quite an interesting use case. So, Chris, um, are you there? I am. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. You know and you know what I've got to do now. I've got to uh, to quickly uh, give you the. I'm going to change it so you're completely and utterly uh, in charge, Chris. Uh oh, look out, everybody. Um, yeah. Thanks. For, so just just as well as that, um, big thanks uh, for for the invitation, and thank you um, to all of you for giving up your time as well, sir, on a on a Friday and um, to to come and listen to us. Hope you can see my screen now. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna very very quickly because I'm mindful of time and I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for the for the chat with the panelists afterwards. So I want to take you through the approach we used um, at East Midlands Chamber. We were focused on uh, Leicester and Leicestershire. Um, that was the area, uh, one of the eight trailblazer areas, and it's in our patch. Um, and I suppose you wanted to take DFE at their word. This was a pilot project. It was a chance to try and do something different and to think differently about a problem that's been a problem for a long, long time. As I'm sure you'll all, uh, you'll all, uh, you'll, you'll all have your own scars from working in this space for. So we want to try and do something different. Uh, and actually the, the data-led approach, the, the approach to data, both working with MZ and also working with um, uh, open source data. So uh, DFE um, has a data, uh, other sources as well. Um, I, I think did give us a chance to do something different. There were four, very, very briefly, there were four areas where we wanted to innovate and have a bit of a, have a bit of a, uh, an, an attempt to see if we put something different in at the, the one end, you get something different out the other end. So very quickly, those four areas. First of all, in terms of how we gathered the data, how we accessed the second data in the first place. So we're very fortunate to have um, a great partnership uh, with one of our local universities, Montford University. And uh, we've got a knowledge transfer partnership. And through that, we have someone working with us who is um, an absolute whiz and expert when it comes to coding and writing scripts. And so what Harsh was able to do was pre, uh, create a number of scripts um, that essentially scraped data from various sources uh, and pulled it into uh, uh, into our side and presented it um, via a series of dashboards. And it was Harsh who worked with Emergy and setting up the, the API, which we're really, really pleased with. And I shall show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, why, why do we want to take this approach? Well, first of all, um, uh, it's automated, so the scripts are run, uh, are created, they run in the background, they um, generate the reports automatically when new data sets um, get refreshed, uh, so does our data, so it removes lots of that like, human intervention, and it means that, um, that it's always current, I suppose. Um, and secondly, it's something that's uh, eminently scalable. So obviously this was a trailblazer in Leicester and Leicestershire, but the approach we developed here um, is easily scalable, whether that's by sector or by geography or, or anywhere else. So 
that's the first area of innovation. The second area, um, which is something I, I, I feel quite passionate about actually, because I don't think it always gets the attention uh, that it should. And that's um, the narrative that you create around the data. So it's all well and good to, to get lots of really interesting data sets and to kind of you know, crunch them together and present them in, in, in cool ways. But actually the vast majority of those people that we want to be using this as a, as a useful tool, um, they, they will have very different levels of, uh, of ability when it comes to interpreting data. Um, what is it, lies, down lies and statistics, et cetera. So we wanted to try and support people to access what we were showing them in a way that would be very clear, uh, make great sense and take something, and this is a key principle actually, take something that um, is interesting and transform it into something that is useful. And so the tests that we, we applied and everything we were doing, there were all sorts of variables we could have used, but the test we ran it through was, is this going to be useful? If the answer wasn't a resounding yes, then you know, let's not clutter up um, what we're trying to show with noise that you know might well be interesting, but isn't going to be useful. And the, the third area of, uh, of innovation was around how we access the primary data, so the business survey data. And again, we're really, um, it was a bit of a risk because we've not done it this way before, but I think it paid off. Um, we, we didn't run a massive survey uh, or we tried to reach the thousands of businesses. Um, we didn't hold um, you know, dozens of focus groups. What we did is we created a representative business panel of those sectors we were looking at. We were focused in on three sectors and we kept it tight because it was a pilot. Um, and we got those businesses to download an app onto their mobile phones and they receive daily questions um, at nine o'clock every morning. And uh, the, again, the, the rule that we set ourselves was if it takes longer than 30 seconds to answer, then, um, then this isn't, you know, it's, it's not the right question to be asking. Um, but through that, we, the response rate was fantastic, I have to say, you weren't sure, but it was in the 90%, high 90% all the way, way through. Um, but we, we, we've got different sort of information than you would normally get. And also because it was a survey that ran over a period of time, um, the data is always fresh and you can go back and test things again and you can see how it might have changed over, 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 over the month. Um, so a new way of collecting the primary data. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that uh, in a moment. And then finally, the fourth area of innovation, which again, we're really pleased with what we got out of this is, we didn't ask businesses to tell us about the roles they were creating. Um, and we, we didn't kind of ask them what jobs will they, will, will they have uh, in the future. And the reason being, that's really hard for particularly small businesses to, to really know and to, and to be able to talk with confidence about. And actually, they get asked that a lot. And if, and if the answers that came back from that were the, were the right answers, then again, would, would we be in the position we currently are in? Um, so we took a different approach. We asked businesses about the key knowledge areas, the key skill areas and the key behavioral areas that they think would be important to have in their people for their growth aspirations over the coming two years, this time period we used. And there's three reasons why we focus on KSBs. Firstly, we think KSBs have more stickability, they're less transient, so they don't change as much um, over time, whereas you know, jobs can change and roles can change. In the past two years have been the best example of that, haven't they, I think. Um, KSB areas, yes, they change, yes, they might evolve, but perhaps not at the same kind of rate. Um, secondly, um, I said we only focused in on a few sectors for the pilot. They're a bit more sector agnostic, uh, KSBs. Again, not 100% sector agnostic, but it's definitely read across uh, between, uh, between different sectors. And finally, and probably most importantly, actually, we know that working with educators and those in the education sector, um, KSBs is the language that they talk in. It's the language that curriculum gets developed around. Um, it creates read across to have this common um, taxonomy between what businesses say they want and what educators are providing. So there are the four areas we tried to do something different in. I will very quickly, because I am out of time, show you where we ended up. Um, if anyone wants more time, to, so I'm going to whiz through this now. If anyone wants more time uh, to, to have a look, it, the website's live, um, insight-unlocks.co.uk. Um, by all means, please do go and have an explore and, and feel free to, to drop us a line if you have any feedback. There's, you can contact us in the About Us tab. So let's have a quick look then. And um, this is the page that we uh, developed. So I'll take the, uh, the, the second innovation first, I guess, if I can. So the narrative. So we, we created a series of user channels, depending on who you might be. So you can see we've got six there. Um, 
And the idea being that if you are an educator or a funder or an employer or whoever, a parent, um, you would uh, select your user journey and you would the, the journey you take through the different dashboards and the data would be different because you know you're, you're look you you know what what an educator might want to find out will be different potentially for what a parent might want to look at and find out um, or certainly the route through might be different. Uh, I think there's a lot more work to be done on this. This is only a pilot, and we're pleased to have got where we got to. Um, as we develop this as a product and the and the tool, we want to invest a lot more in this part of it, um, embedding videos and better data visualization, but that's that's i suppose the, the you know how, how we responded to that innovation what about the first one the, the gathering data so essentially we've got uh two two, two areas of dashboards we've got skills supply and um, and we've got skills demand um and i'll just take you into one or two so you can see what they look like let's go into he um so for every dashboard perhaps obvious but important to say what does the dashboard show so what am I what am I looking at? Because you know, it won't always be clear to people. How is it useful? Again, you know, an obvious thing to state, but we think it needs to be stated. Uh, and and where does it and where does it come from? Um, every dashboard can be uh, expanded out. Um, and this is uh, yeah. So so here we're in Aston Last Church. You can see the three universities down there. You can see how many people are studying what. Um, the data will be updated. Uh, the data will be updated automatically um, as, uh, as, as new data sets come out. Um, and uh, yeah, read alongside. I mean, interesting on its own. Read alongside A levels, you know, G stage four, GCSE, FE, etc. Um, you know, you you start to develop a picture of from a skills supply point of view what in last semester is being produced. Skills demand. So this is where we used uh, where we partnered with Emsi and had some of the um, had some of the the great insight we were able to get from the um, from the API, um, uh, as you can see there. Um, so here we're looking um, at uh, occupation forecast data. Um, you can look at how and expand it out. Um, but do go and have a look if you're interested. You can look at jobs or placements or openings, the three sectors that we focused in on. Uh, you can go to a local, different local authority levels. Um, and see, um, yeah, it kind of speaks speaks for itself. Um, again, the occupation forecast right alongside industry growth forecast, graduate destinations, the top titles and skills postings um, uh, in terms of uh, jobs, job vacancies being created. Taken all together, you get a picture and hopefully the journey that you get sent through it gives you um, a better picture of where the, what the supply is producing and what the demand is asking for. So that's the secondary data. The, the primary data, the, the business survey stuff that we developed uh, via the app. And I just need to wait a second as this uh, loads up. I'll know when it's loaded up, so I'll get a few messages pop up in my top right hand uh, corner. This is testing my Wi-Fi now uh, on a Friday afternoon. Here we go. Um, I'll just give you a quick sense of what we got from it. And again, this is a you know this is a pilot project. There's more we could do and there's more we will do as we develop the project. But um, uh, daily questions asked businesses. Um, the questions are themed around five areas. Uh, every Monday, there's a confidence type question. Every Tuesday, investment. Wednesday, knowledge. Thursday, skills. Friday, behaviors. And this is the kind of stuff that we got out of it. And again, Harsh, um, through the KTP uh, partnership with DMU, wrote the codes to, you know, sc you know immediately produce these reports from the answers we got back. So we should have followed knowledge areas are most important and think about future people needs, uh, school, uh, people needs, you can see how people scored it there. Um, relatively speaking, how important on a scale of one to 10 is having people with required knowledge to your success. Uh, other questions, how easy it's to recruit, etc. Where do you, so this one down here, where do you, when it comes to knowledge based recognitions, which ones have value to you? So you can compare A-levels with friendships, with degrees, with uh, postgraduate degrees, et cetera. And this is where do you go to find people uh, with those with those right knowledge areas. So word of mouth always scores high as there's online recruitment platforms. But you, you, you get us, without going into so much what the results actually say or show, you get a sense of, you know, we asked something different in a different way. And I think we've got a slightly you know, different uh, different results, and then it becomes more interesting again when you compare 
uh, knowledge of skills. So again, you know, how, how important is how important like skills for your success? Slightly higher scores than uh, when we were asking about knowledge and, and again, behaviours. And again, I wonder if people can guess this, uh, probably. Um, behaviour scored higher than skills and knowledge in terms of the relative importance. And again, intuitively, you might have been able to kind of guess at that from conversations with businesses, but you, we've actually got a, a score, a relative score now. Um, the whole idea of, of doing the work this way um, was we didn't want to just produce a report that, um, uh, that you know, the, plan, the P and LSIP, the local solution plan, wasn't the the end product and i think if you if you if you, if you think of lsips as just being you know the production of a product and then what happens happens i think that's probably the wrong mindset for us it was a whole process and the process of gathering the intelligence presenting the intelligence and forming a narrative and then producing a report that actually points people back to the uh, points people back to this this as a tool I think it's something that's really important to us and the relationships that we, I, I would say, obviously a big chunk of work went into doing all the data side of it, but an equal amount of work went into engaging uh, the, the FE judges and the um, other stakeholders um, in the area, you know, other, you know, other providers to try and make sure we, everyone was putting into it, helping refine it and, and using it. And the early signs are that it is being used. And sorry, finally, uh, if, if people are interested, then you can download the full report again from the web page. Um, that's the that's our roadmap for change that we came up with. Uh, our recommendations are very much around the structures that exist, uh, as much as anything too prescriptive. Um, we're pleased with where we ended up. Lots more to do. You know, we can definitely uh, in, in, improve on it and continue to improve on it. And that's hopefully what we uh, will be doing in our in our next steps. But hopefully, as a as an intro to what we did and the approach we took. Hopefully that sparks some thoughts and some questions. So with that, Will, I'll um, I'll wait for you to take the screen back from me, and, uh, yes, and let uh, I'll do. Time. I'll I'll do that seamlessly. Um, he says um, while clicking frantically. Um, that was really um, great. I appreciate you taking us all through that, Chris. I think there's a, there's a couple of things that immediately jumped out to me, and I've probably got a few questions uh, for you. Um, I think. If, if the ask of the trailblazers was to, for providers to collaborate, the funding the funding essentially will be for providers to collaborate and collectively respond to skilled priorities um, that are identified by the LSIP. I think there's some really interesting uh, things that were coming out there. I thought that that, that uh, the value that employers were putting onto the um, uh, onto behaviours was really was it's probably not completely surprising but still interesting to see where that was where that ranked overall um i guess a question i've got and you've alluded to this is this was where you got to in actually quite a short period of time um if i think about the time that you had access to the um the time that you had access to to our api it was a very short window of time um first quarter of this year really was what was what you had to play with you must have things that you wanted to implement or want to implement in this next phase could you just take us through a few of the kind of priorities for phase two yeah uh, absolutely there's four areas i think that we really want to focus in on um, in phase two and um, so first of all you're right we didn't you know that we didn't have uh, that long to have access to the data, um, whether it's the stuff that we worked with on you or the uh, open source data. Um, mm. Some of the open source data, we had to work quite hard at getting the, the, you know, the, the quality of it, the consistency of it. When you want to apply um, you know, automation, you need to have consistency and quality. So there's a lot of work running to getting that fit for purpose. So we think in the next phase two, there's more work to be done on the data sets that exist. To make sure that we're, you know, we're showing everything that could, you know, add value, and that, and there's new things out there that we're learning about as well. And so another big thing we've done is had conversations of all sorts of organisations, Alan Turing Institute um, included, where we're finding out about new data sets we could potentially pull in. That's the first area. The second day, uh, area, I think the data visualisation, the user journey and narrative. Really excited to do more about that, and I'm talking to a couple of universities about potential partnerships that could help us develop that further. Uh, the third area is the app. We use the third party um, app, which wasn't really designed for the purpose we used it for, 
that we um, we bent it towards our purpose and it ended up you know being great that we think you know that we can potentially get something a bit more fit for purpose and refine that and refine the methodology you know how we ask questions the way we divvy questions up because that's a whole skill in itself that we learned as we went along and then finally i suppose you know we think we've got a really cool product here and we want to make sure the product itself is resilient um and uh, and secure um so perhaps not as exciting but incredibly important so that'll be the fourth area of focus yeah that makes that all, all sounds uh sounds sounds sensible and, and kind of feeds into other other things that you were taking us through during your presentation um, I was going to now uh, broaden things out and uh, introduce uh, my colleague uh, Ben. Ben, are you there? I am indeed. Afternoon, everyone. Always reassuring. Um, ben, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, and I'll and, and if you can introduce our other guests as well, um, and then we can we can have a broader conversation, bringing in some other perspectives. Thank, thanks, Will. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My, my name is Ben Owen. I'm the director further education um, so I'll come to our FE business um, across the UK and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined this afternoon um, because I know how busy their divers are um, uh, by Andrew Copley who's the principal and CEO of, of West Knox College um, and Spencer more from um, um, Spar as well so good afternoon Andrew and Spencer thanks for joining us. Hi Ben. Hi Ben. So I think it, it obviously <laughs> Collaboration is not new to the world of FE. Um, I think is the is the disclaimer I'll I'll start with. I think you alluded to that well um, uh, as well as as you did, Chris. I think obviously collaborations um, have been about for a long, long time, and, and there's lots of good examples across the sector where, where colleges are working with schools, colleges, uh, uh, universities, um, employers, etc. But I think when we start to look at um, LSIP for me and, and like I said, the skills for those papers, it's very much laser focus on um, you know how things are going to work regionally and obviously there's the the, the, the looming um, 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 caveat around devolution and the need to collaborate around funding, particularly in the adult um, um, piece. The first question um, that, that I've got for Andrew and, and, and you know there's some fantastic collaboration work happening at, at West Knots, particularly the work uh, with Nottingham Trent University around higher technical provision. But Andrew, obviously this is a raft of policies that the sector part for the last sort of couple of years have come out come as thick and fast. What opportunity um, do you see that LSIP presents um, for the sector and, and how is the college um, a, a approaching these opportunities and making the most of them? So I, I think the LSIP is a, is a huge opportunity. I, I, I think primarily it's because colleges um, ever since I've been in the sector, which is nearly 13, just over 13 years actually now, um, have tried to understand what the business need is and tried to recover from, from a previous 20 year history of education and industry being separated. Um, and it's hard work. Uh, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort um, to, to get out and talk to businesses. And I think also we've become mired in, in the marketization of education in, in having rather transactional conversations with employers, often trying to sell them stuff, uh, apprenticeships or whatever it might be. Um, and I think this gives us a real opportunity to create uh, a comprehensive um, two-way dialogue with the industry, which enables us to really understand not just what they need, but how they need it how they perceive us, what, what the limitations are that we are presenting to them, but also for them to, to understand us better um, and to, to work with us to, to help us shape the provision, to help us um, take our provision deeper, to help people in schools to understand what the offer of, of FE is, um, to start to change some of those, uh, those middle class presumptions that, that a successful journey has to be GCSEs, A-levels, universities, uh, and professional careers, um, and start to really shape those conversations into the much wider tapestry that there is. So, so I think there's, there's there's huge opportunity if we get this right. Frustratingly, it's surrounded by some some policy agendas which have taken us in a completely different direction, and um, and we have to challenge ourselves to rise above that market force that we're driven towards. And it's not too difficult for us because we're in a relatively captured catchment but I know in, in, in more metropolitan parts of the country there's a lot of competition between colleges and I think we have to try and find ways to 
to rise above that to really make the most opportunity that this current agenda presents us. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Andrew. I mean, I think obviously marketization, like you say, is, is, is the sort of elephant in the room around a lot of this collaboration. But I think it, it, it's good to hear, particularly, you know, obviously from, from a chief exec, how, how open you are to that collaboration. And like I said, the, 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 the stuff that you do with Nottingham Trent is, is particularly fascinating and has been a really successful partnership. Yeah. I think feeding back on um, Chris's demonstration, it was great to see um, second in Will's point, it's great to see the stuff around behaviours and particularly around transferable skills and and, and 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 common skills. But when you look at when you approach planning and and, and particularly you know, in this time of of, of these LSIT pilots and as, as you're moving forward, how critical is is data like um, employer demand, um, skill data, um, you know, occupational forecasting? How critical is data when you're deciding the design of the curriculum for the college? So, so data is clearly, clearly a really important start point, um, and you know, the, the, the MC data set that we have access to is, is incredibly valuable. Um, but I, I think you know our approach is always that, that the data really just tells you what questions to ask, um, and so the really important things to, to, to take into mind when you look at the data is what, what's driving the data to where it is. What are the assumptions that stand underneath that data? Uh, and if we don't like the data, what can we do to change it? And, and I think in, in places like Mansfield, Nashfield, where, where my college operates, you know, the data presents a pretty bleak picture uh, of what the prospects for local people are. And so, so the challenge for us, uh, colleges in similar places like us, is to, is to challenge ourselves, say, well, what can we do to change that future, to make the opportunities for young people and indeed uh, older people uh, make those prospects much better and you know that's partly why we were driven um, to, to work in partnership with Nottingham Trent University who can bring much more muscle, much more investment uh, to our communities. That's why we, uh, without any data to support it, without, without any employers really driving us to have, have, have created an automation and robotics provision. In fact, you know, when I arrived here there was a statistic that told me that 30% of local jobs would be lost to automation and robotics. So, so our response to that is well, if if those if those technologies are coming to our packs, then let's make sure we've got people that can uh, that can can program those robots and can can fix them when they go wrong, uh, and service them to start and try and stop them going wrong. So, so that's driven a, a two million pound in investment in a training program here at the college, and is is behind a twenty million pound towns fund investment to try and turn Mansfield and Ashfield into an automation robotics centre for for the Midlands, if not the UK, and 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 so. Trying to grasp that data, get under the skin, and, and find ways to to make things better is is really important. And of course, when you align the sort of information and data that Chris has presented, and I think there's huge potential in in the the approach that's taken to really get under the skin of how we make that dynamic work, how we make ourselves more accessible to businesses, how we make sure we're having the right conversations at the right point in time, so that our courses are relevant. Um, to young people and to businesses that we're able to pitch them in a way that excites people and that they take people into great jobs. Absolutely and, and it's, it's a really good example um, that you, you make around automation and I, I think you know, I, it's fantastic what the college does I mean, if people um, are more interested I'm, I'm sure Andrew will, will share um, um, after this work we're doing but Absolutely, there's an element where this isn't around that levelling up, right? So there's, like you rightly said, Andrew, there's lots of policies, pieces kicking about, but the ability for local residents and Mansfield and Asheville to to feel comfortable to know that higher education offer is in their town, rather than having to travel uh, down to Nottingham, which can be quite prohibitive for people, or you know, and restrictive, is 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 a is, is a great thing. I think that, that that's coming out of the agenda. So so thank you for that. Um, let's, so if, I, if I bring you in, um, it's, it's obviously SimSpa work where we're involved um, in the catchable pilot. And, and, and from your perspective, you know, what have been the key benefits and the key positives that you've seen from this pilot in terms of obviously feeding employer input um, uh, into curriculum design of the future? What do you think have been the key benefits so far? Um, yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, we, we were we were one of the um, uh, bodies that supported Chris um, 
in the Leicester pilot, we've also been working with with Andrews College um, in terms of a smaller pilot that, that we've been been uh, running with them. Um, and I think that that um, sort of two or three things from, from our perspective as a sector, we're, we're going through a, quite a significant transformational change in terms of almost the role and function um, of our sector. You know, very heavily linking into health, preventative health. Uh, you know, that, that I was at a meeting. Uh, this morning, uh, you know, uh, that estimated that you know that um, if our workforce would have the right skills and the behaviours um, moving forward, then you know we, we could let's say the UK 20 billion pounds. Um, so for uh, for us, this this piece of work is 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 critical um, if we're going to start to influence um, the supply side uh, of our uh, of our education system. And so we've been working on KSBs, agree completely with, with Chris around KSBs in, in looking at the jobs and roles and functions in, um, in, our, in our sector. And again, what, what's come out 100% uh, from conversations we've had with employers in our sectors is uh, skills and behaviours are king. Um, uh, that, that's the real big missing link um, for, for employers. And again, if you, you start to think about young people um, starting off on their career, you know, that the, the insight tells you these young people will have uh, multiple jobs across multiple sectors. So um, the fascinating piece uh, from, from Chris's work was, you know, that there was a sales and transport and logistics, uh, but the, the, the KSBs, uh, as well, especially the, the, the S's and the B's were very, very similar. So there's a real chance here for some innovative curriculum design that, that um, um, the industries will, will, you know, will, will create a much rounder uh, young person who can work across multiple industries because um, all sectors are, are looking for the same thing. And, and I think the other key thing for us is the, um, uh, the getting underneath that data um, for us and um, understanding what sort of job roles that, that affects and then subsequently the work we've done with um, the four colleges in, in Leicestershire as part of the pilot and also the work that we're doing with, with Andrews College is then how does that impact on, on curriculum design. So we've worked quite heavily um, in that area in terms of really starting to introduce a, a much heavier emphasis on, on skills. Um, but again, if you look at the uh, Chris's report, especially in, in our sector, there, there's a real he still a heavy drive on these professional qualifications or these professional license to practice. So just, just sort of an example of, of what we're doing at West Knots is we've, we've worked with the team there and we've redeveloped their level two and created a, a, a curriculum that, that is basic, based on a core product of, of, of customer service and skills um, and, and, and um, then bolted in a, a set of um, technical qualifications that, that sit around that core curriculum that ultimately um, gives the employer the confidence that these people will come in with those skills and, and behaviours, um, but also have the right licence to practise for the various jobs. And again, when you look at you know the, the 24 learners that we've, we've just worked through with uh, with West Knots with Andrew, you know that not all of them are going into uh, employment in our sector. But because we've got that core curriculum and that transferable skills, that they're all going to, to some form of uh, positive positive destination. And I think that that's really critical for young people. You know, that, that I've got a 17 year old lad who, you know, just in his A levels, really still doesn't know what what he wants to do. So so making sure that we uh, we don't pigeonhole people, that we we have these transferable skills. But those that really know what they want to do, we're giving them the opportunity and the license to actually get into employment. Um, so, so yeah, I, th I think um, this data-driven approach uh, really gives us chance to innovate in the way that um, you know colleges and universities and others can can start to look at their curriculum design. I mean, I, I couldn't agree anymore. A great example, thank you, Spencer. And and, and again, I, I can't agree anymore around transferable skills. I think that for me is um, one of the big opportunities. I was, I was at a conference yesterday talking to representatives from the. Education Training Foundation around transferable skills and the need to help our, our current Y12 cohorts and future Y12 cohorts that have been through COVID. The, the data is pretty much saying, you know, those communications, customer service, resilience, all those type of things branch many, many roles, don't we? So I think giving this, you know, empowering the students to develop those skills and making sure the funding is there for colleges to spend, um, you know, quality, quality time on that provision is critical moving forward so i think absolutely fascinating 
example um, that you're doing and again I'm sure you'll probably have or we'll have lots of questions from people um, after the webinar um, uh, around the work that you're doing so thank you um, for that Spencer um, well I think I think over to you if you've got any any more questions I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Andrew and Spencer for, for taking the time out this afternoon to, to, to be part of this and obviously sharing fantastic practice and, and, and great insight into the opportunity that this policy is currently um, giving employers and, and, and the FE space. No, 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 no specific questions from me. Um, I've got some observations which, which I'll share in a bit. I think, I think the, yeah, the, the, the key thing I wanted to, to mention is it feels like this is very much a moment in time and it'd be really interesting as we get into um, the, the rollout and into the next phase to revisit this conversation because it this is a moment in time um, but obviously think there's ambition here to progress um, on all fronts and I think revisiting that uh, at some point uh, either later in the year or early next year would be really interesting so I, I'd, if we can drag everyone back that would be great um, but yeah thanks for finding the time and thanks to Chris um, just wanted to um, to share a few few thoughts and, I, and I'd be interested to get through from you Ben as well um, in regards to things that you, you've uh, picked up through the session this afternoon I think there were a couple of things that were said right at the start by Chris that I thought were really important we talk um, as you'd imagine being uh, MC Vernon Glass we talk a lot about data um, but that point about supporting people to access it and ensuring that it's pitched in the right way, taking out the noise so that you get to the useful, insightful and interesting um, insight or, or, or data, um, it, it seems to be something that we could, should definitely uh, uh, continue to evolve our thinking both internally, but it's interesting that it's also there in terms of how you bring in other organizations or stakeholders i think chris was talking specifically about how you bring in that prime draw in that primary evidence from employers by surveying them in in a in a way in which you're going to keep them engaged and you can ask them things on multiple times um, rather than one long survey that asks numerous things um, in probably a quite a complex and uh, an interesting way so I thought that was really interesting um, the other thing that I picked up um, and again not, not not completely new but I thought it's come through really loud um, in this afternoon's session is that importance of behaviors of common skills transferable skills um, those skills as you were just saying Ben that are going to be much needed continue to be much needed within the labor market um, and are obviously um, viewed in that way by employers based on the work that Chris has been doing through the LSIP trailblazer. But um, did you have anything to share in terms of uh, summing up remarks? I mean, I think Andrew um, and, and Chris and, and Spencer all alluded to this, but I think the future is the future is bright and the future is collaboration. I, I think Andrew, Andrew very, very nicely articulated the need to kind of rise above marketization uh, which i know is difficult uh, you know and, and, and again he, he he alluded to the fact that not every college not every college's patch or uh, demography is, is 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 similar but but i do think moving if we're going to get this right and crack this then i do think there needs to be you know that that very sort of higher level um view of we're doing it for the place we're doing it for the region and ultimately we need to collaborate together now there's lots of things that are pulling against that like Andrew suggested you know obviously around um, interventions with colleges if they're not hitting budgets etc but but I do think that the future is is collaboration and and, and really a, a sort of push again around like I said we, we've, I've said this in a few webinars now um, at the strategic level that the need to make sure that, that we fund and see see those common skills as, as just as important as the the technical higher technical skills um, yeah. you know the, Funding's not weighted really um, around that, but actually, when you speak to employer bodies and like Chris has, has, has articulated um, in his demonstration, those type of skills, you know, employers really resonate with, and, and I think 
they've kind of fallen down the, the pecking order for various reasons um, in, in terms of value of funding. But I think that that's absolutely critical, and particularly with the impact impact of COVID on our, on our younger um, students. You know, white kids that have had you know, two years worth of of school um, education disrupted, or three years in in some cases. Then then it really is the need to to, to be able to look at that from a funded perspective and ensure that that we we we, we raise the value of those. Um, on a par with with the technical skills as well. Just just to say, um, um, I, in the follow up, we will share the web link um, that Chris was um, taking you through. And as he said, the report um, on the trailblazer that they've run in East Midlands um, or wow. in Leicester and Leicestershire that will be um, is available to download on the website. Um, and obviously, if you've got specific questions, um, do come back to us and we can share those. Uh, with any of the panelists and yes thanks again um, to Andrew, Chris and Spencer for joining us. A um, couple of things to mention just as we wrap up. Um, um, coming up um, we are going to be producing reports very much focused on levelling up, looking at job and employer demand growth, um, the share of high skilled people and jobs in a particular area and industrial and skills complexity. Those should be available in June uh, we're working on that at the moment, um, but yeah, useful for one to you for you to be aware of. Um, also, we are looking for sponsors for a UK research report, um, which we will also uh, be talking about more. But if you'd like to find out more about that uh, research report and how you might want to get involved, do make contact. And then it's just to mention forthcoming webinars. So 28th of June, we've got the final one in our Leveling Up Agenda series, focusing on reducing disparities. Um, and you can register for that using the link down here or on our website. And then um, Ben is back um, with guest speaker Ben Knotts, who's the assistant principal uh, for students at Western College. And that's looking at helping students understand their potential career pathways. So um, thank you all for attending. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Ben. And um, I'll hope to see you at a webinar soon. Take care. Bye bye. Everyone.